All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Deer Hunting 102. And uh, thanks for joining us here today. This is a nice little midday webinar. Um, so some quick reminders before we get started. Just some webinar reminders for folks if this is your first time. So your microphones and webcams are disabled. So if you have any questions, you can put that in the Q&A question window box, or you can put that in the chat where I said hello earlier. Uh, you can talk to each other too, if you'd like, uh, through the chat window as well, or uh, ask any of us a question. Either myself or Curtis will answer you in the chat, or uh, the person presenting at that time can answer um, via their microphone. Uh, so we will be sending you guys a copy of this PowerPoint um, and possibly some, inf uh, some informative handouts that go along with PowerPoint, as well as a YouTube link recording for this webinar and uh, a survey as well to ask you how, how uh, your experience was uh, going through this webinar as well. Um, so if you have any questions, we'll have some time at the end um, so we can stick around here as long as you like and answer any questions you may have uh, about this webinar, general hunting in Illinois. So a course outline. Um, so this is 102. So we're going to be not talking about regs as much as we did in 101. Um, so we're going to go right into it and talk a little bit about, um, well, first we'll do a review of 101 real quick. And then we're going to talk about how hunting is a management for wildlife. And then we're going to get into deer vocalizations and calling and when to use vocalizations and when to use different calls. And then we're going to talk about scent control and different types of scents, like attractants and lures that you might use and different products you may see on the shelf and what may work and what might not work. Then we're going to talk about tree stands. Um, there's various different types of tree stands and different types of hunting. So we'll just cover those for people who may not be aware of them. And then we'll go into after the shot and what you need to do um, once you have done all this work up front. Once you finally take that shot, how do you go and find your deer and the do's and don'ts of that process? We'll do a quick review of field dressing a deer. And uh, we do have a, a really good video online right now at our YouTube page and you can get a better visual of what that might look like and there are some other videos out there that kind of help you along and of course it's never the same as actually doing it um, but it is a good help before you head out there and try to figure it out so we'll cover that and then we'll finish off with a little summation of what's going on with chronic waste and disease. Um, today I'm Jason Buckley uh, welcome and with me today is Curtis Twelman. Hello everybody. Hey, Curtis, thanks for joining us. Um, so we're going to get started off with Curtis, who's going to do a quick review of Deer 101. All right. So some of you uh, were with us for Deer 101. And in Deer 101, uh, a lot of regs. We're not going to be uh, going into the regs much today. But if you do have questions about that, feel free to throw it in the, the Q&A uh, box that you have there or the chat, or uh, we'll hit it at the end. But um, in general, we talked in 101 about how basically hunters fund conservation. So not just by buying your license and stamps, uh, but then also by that excise tax that's placed on firearms at the manufacturer level uh, that goes into the Pittman-Robertson Act. So basically in more ways than one, hunters fund conservation. And then alternatively, the other groups like Pheasants Forever, National Wild Turkey Federation, Ducks Unlimited, uh, groups like that that are doing great habitat work, uh, those are in large part, um, you know, the membership is hunters, so those dollars are coming from hunters as well. So one which way or another, pretty much all conservation in North America comes from hunters. Um, we talked a lot about the regulations in 101. We talked about how to find uh, places to hunt. So we talked about that hunt planner website. Um, and maybe Jason can drop that in the in the chat there, but really nice website by the IDNR. You can look by species, you can look by region, you can look by county, a lot of different ways to search for public land that might be open for you to hunt. We know that in Illinois, we're limited in public land. Unfortunately, there's just, there's not a, a ton of it out there. Um, so we got to make do with what we have. This, uh, this website is a great tool for finding that and, and finding some local gyms. And when it comes to archery, uh, for the most part, most of that public land is just open for you to hunt. Uh, when it comes to the firearms tags, those on public land are generally draw, uh, so a little bit tougher. But for the people who are archery hunting, definitely a lot of opportunities out there. Uh, so get on that website, check out what public spots are out there, and um, there's probably a place close to home. 
We also talked a little bit about deer behavior and how that changes throughout the season. We'll talk a little bit more about behavior um, today in this webinar. But in general, uh, remember that deer change throughout the season. So when you start hunting potentially on October 1st, uh, you might be completely on a food to bed pattern. Then as we get closer to what's called the rut, which is the, the deer breeding season, which by the way is completely driven by photo period, uh, the amount of daylight. So I know a lot of people think that the weather or the moon or a bunch of different factors play into there. And while those things may impact deer movement uh, on a very fine scale, when it comes to the actual breeding season, the rut uh, driven by hormones, completely length of day driven. So you can pretty much figure here in Illinois, our peak rut, um, the best time to be hunting last week of October, first week of November, most people agree. And then that lockdown period starts in mid-November, sometime around November 10th to 14th is, is the actual first breeding period. Uh, White-tailed deer have a 28-day cycle. So then 28 days later, there's a secondary rut, but that first rut is, is kind of the primary thing that gets whitetail hunters excited. After that, in late season, you go more to that early season strategy where you're just kind of thinking of food to bed and getting in between there uh, with, with reproduction, not really driving much of that efforts. Um, and then we talked about some of the resources that we have on YouTube. And Jason mentioned a, a great one, that field dressing video. Field dressing is the one thing that we can't really show in a workshop unless if we just so if somebody hits a deer on the way to the workshop, maybe, but uh, even if we find a road kill deer, we, you know, you have to get those guts out uh, right away. So um, video is unfortunately some of the best we can do there, but that is a great video that Jason's talking about and recommend you, you check that out. All right, so wildlife management and deer hunting. So deer are herbivores. Some of you might live in the suburbs. You might try to plant some hostas or, or maybe a garden, and maybe you have nuisance issues with deer. Uh, likewise, large-scale farmers um, can have larger-scale nuisance issues with, with deer when it comes to grains and stuff that they eat. So while we as hunters generally think of deer as a good thing, um, everybody's excited about deer season, we like to eat deer, other people, other groups of people may not see deer in such a favorable uh, light. So there is certainly a nuisance issue when it comes to deer. And remember that uh, back in the, back before regulated hunting was a thing in, in what we call the age of extermination, we basically wiped out most of the large predators uh, that primarily fed upon deer. Now we've still got coyotes, we've still got bobcats, and yes, they still do eat deer, even adult deer. It, is it common? Not very common because um, uh, an adult deer it is a very dangerous prey item for something the size of a coyote or a bobcat, but it does happen. But the larger predators, the wolves, the cougars, they're for the most part off the landscape. So that leaves uh, basically man being the, uh, humans being the one basically predator that can control the population. And so that's what the hunting season's designed to do. Um, basically wildlife managers use uh, a, a basically a basic formula to get what they feel is the population for white-tailed deer. And then we can find out what portion of that population it can be taken each year without affecting that population. And that's what they strive to do. If we're at a place that we want to stay at, which Illinois pretty much is, we're happy with our deer population. There's not a whole lot of room for it to go up. It's pretty high. If anything, it could probably go down, but uh, to support a lot of hunting opportunities, uh, we showed in, the, in Deer 101 that the deer harvest year after year in Illinois is remarkably stable, uh, which just shows that that's, that's working. And the amount of deer that we take each year falls in that area that we call the harvestable surplus. And that's, uh, it, some of you might have taken wildlife biology back in, in high school or in college. And you know that um, critters are either what they call K strategists or R strategists. 
And our strategist, your prototypical is your mice. They, they reproduce like crazy. They don't live very long. Uh, the vice versa of that is the case strategist, which people, we make up the best example of that. We don't reproduce very much, but we live a long time. And so on that spectrum, deer are definitely much more close to an R strategist. Uh, they do have uh, an average of around two fawns per year. So a lot will have one, a lot will have two. Every once in a while, you'll have a doe that'll have three fawns, um, but that's every single year. And then the life expectancy for wild deer is not that high. A two or three year old deer is starting to be uh, older than average out there. So basically each spring they produce way more deer than the landscape can, can hold. And of course it can hold all those deer when times are plenty, uh, deer are herbivores. So in the spring, the summer, and then in the harvest time in the fall with the acorns, got a lot of food out there for them. Then the winter hits, snow, ice, food availability is at its lowest. Now, uh, basically, the amount of deer that were there in the spring, the, the habitat can no longer support it. So luckily, we've got the hunting season that falls in before there. So we reduce the population until it's at a level that the uh, landscape can support. And that's uh, evident in the very stable harvest total that we have year after year. All right, so we talked a little bit about calls rattling and stuff like that in 101. And, and basically, this is a rut strategy. Pre-rut and rut is when to do these. Deer are not out there uh, just fighting for no reason. They're not um, knocking antlers at any given time. They're not, um, you know, real receptive to calling. They're not a super uh, reliant on call species. So Really, it's that uh, prime time that I mentioned earlier, the last couple weeks of October, first week of November, that's the time where your grunt calls, your, your rattling antlers, they can be effective. And that's because uh, the, hormone, the hormones in these deer are really heightened. You know, some of them are out there looking to scrap, they're looking for a fight, and they're certainly looking for other deer to either chase away if it's a buck or to kind of say, hey, you know, what, what are you doing if, if it's not a, not a buck? So um, that's your prime time to use calls. And me personally, I'm not a big caller when it comes to deer hunting. Some people are. Uh, do whatever gives you confidence. If you're there in the tree and, and it makes you stay up there longer, if you grab the grunt tube and hit that thing every 30 minutes, then, then go for it. Um, I don't think that that broadcast calling is a super effective strategy when it comes to deer, but anything that keeps you in the woods is an effective strategy. So if it makes you feel better, by all means do it, because um, I, I also don't think you're going to be scaring away all the deer if you do that in a, in a nice, quiet way. And, and grunt calls are a quiet call. We do have an example that you'll, you'll get to hear, but no reason to be super loud on that stuff. Deer can hear for a long ways, especially in the woods. If it's calm, not much wind, uh, sound travels, and, and a deer can hear further than you can. So uh, be, be quiet on those things. But my best, my favorite way to use calls are kind of as my Hail Mary tactic. So I use it if I see a deer and they're not coming into range, right? They're, I see the way they're going. They're not going to get give me an archery shot. If I know I've got no other shot, uh, that would be the time when I would hit the grunt call, maybe hit the rattling antlers if, if I can do it in a way where the deer can't um, uh, spot me, because that's another thing you got to think about. Calling also gives the, the deer a chance to triangulate kind of where you are, and especially if they're close enough to pick up that that sound's coming from maybe up in a tree. Uh, you know, deer have been hunted enough, I think they can start to put two and two together. And uh, yeah, sometimes I think calling can be more of a, a hindrance to some folks than a, than a benefit. So use it sparingly. 
something else to think about Curtis is uh, I've had this happen to me before where I'm sitting on a trail and I'm pretty sure I know where the deer are going to be coming from. And then you start calling or making noises and stuff and you'll get a deer coming from behind you that you'd never thought a deer would come from that way because you called them over to you. So it was, it worked, but now you're there in a spot that you don't have a shooting lane or something like that. So um, this is something to consider. It is fun to do when it, when it does work out though. Well, for sure. Yeah. It's anytime. I mean, me being a, a big duck hunter, turkey hunter, like that's the aspect of, of those species that I love is you get that back and forth. So it, when you do get the rare chance that it does work with whitetail, it's awesome. Like Jason said. Um, oh, and here we've got, uh, does this audio work if you click that one, Jason? Yeah. Yep. So whenever you're ready, I can play it. And um, just a headphone warning. Um, some of these sound effects vary in volume. So uh, just so you know, if you're wearing headphones or earbuds right now, uh, you might want to adjust your volume. I'll play it twice when we do play it. So that way, if you miss the first one, you can hear the second one. Cool. Also, to add to that warning, if you have a furry little friend with you at home, uh, some of these sounds can uh, be startling to uh, puppies. So <laughs> it yeah. might be funny. It might be funny to watch. So um, my but, my na my napping dog's about to wake up for sure, but it's okay. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure, <laughs> especially on on this one. Um, so so this is an alarm call for deer, and a lot of you have heard this. Um, maybe when you're just out hiking or mushroom hunting. Uh, by the way, the late fall mushrooms uh, they're popping. If you can find some moisture, the chicken of the woods, hen of the woods. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of people picking them up. So keep your eyes out. Uh, just an insider tip there. But anyway, back to the deer blow snort. If you ever scare a deer, it wins you, it sees you when you're out hiking around. A lot of times you're going to hear this and Jason's going to play it here for just a second and wake everybody's dogs up. But um, a lot of times this goes along with the deer staring at you and maybe moving its head around to try and get a better look of you. You'll see its ears, you know, really trying to hear anything. It's, it's, and at the same time, it's smelling. It's trying to use all of its senses to figure out what you are. You know, it knows there's something there that it's not excited about, may not know exactly what it is. Um, but a lot of times, once they actually smell you or pick you out as a human, you'll hear what's called this, this deer a blow or a snort call. And if you hear this when you're hunting, a lot of times this, this is game over. So we'll go ahead and play it. So here, here's the warning right here. Well, that one's not too loud. That might not have even uh, woken up the, the furry animals. But now that you've heard it here, you probably recognize, oh, yeah, I have heard that. Maybe even you hear it in the distance, but you don't see the animal doing it. So now you'll know that's uh, usually when the deer picks you out as a person. Yep. And you'll hear that a lot walking in if you're if you accidentally walk across some bedding areas that you didn't know were there. And um, it doesn't mean your hunt's over, so don't feel too discouraged. Um, give them a couple minutes if you're, if it's especially if it's still dark out, you're walking in in the dark. Um, you'll, deer will still come around, so don't don't feel too bad about it. But it definitely wakes you up when you're it's four thirty in the morning and you're walking out. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> for sure. Yep. All right, and this next one is the one I was talking about. This is what uh, most people use when they talk about carrying a deer call with them. A lot of times it's, it's a grunt call. And uh, so this is the, the most common call that hunters use. This is also probably the most common uh, sound that you'll hear deer make. Um, and you'll hear all kinds of bucks make this, even button bucks that are confused. You know, they, they might have some of the hormones there. They don't know what to do with them yet. But um, in this exciting time to hunt, the, the pre-rut late October, sometimes you'll just see these little button bucks running around and they'll be hitting everything they can with their head, you know, trees, other deer, and they'll be grunting. And it, it'll sound a little higher pitch than... Um, the grunt call that we're going to play for you here but um it, it's just funny to because they at that time they feel like they're they're the biggest buck in the world and they're going to do what they feel like big bucks do and it can be a lot of fun to watch um but yeah they do that big bucks will grunt also there's a tending grunt that uh 
that bucks will do when they're act actively um, following a doe, trying to get her to lock down. And uh, we'll go ahead and play this grunt call. So there, here's your headphone warning. Some of you might be saying, oh, man, that, that sounds like my uncle Carl asleep on the couch there. So it's uh, not too uh, unfamiliar of a noise, not too loud um, and, and low. And that's the way you do it in the woods, too. There's um, some people feel like you get out there and you blow a call. Every call you blow in the woods, you have to blow at top volume to try and attract animals from other counties uh, to you or something. And that's usually a bad strategy. Any call, I don't care if it's a deer call, duck call, turkey call, whatever you have, always start quiet and work up and err on the side of, of quiet rather than, than loud. Yeah, this is going to be one that you think you hear and you don't know if you heard it or not. When the, when the other deer out there making this call, you're like, wait, did I just hear it? Was that a grunt? I don't know. And it might just be your shirt ruffling in your ears. <laughs> but yeah. uh but it's, it's always slow, something it's low pitch, you know, which makes it it's uh, the wind can like disguise it, too. I feel like mm -hmm. uh, we have a question. Uh, do deer grunt on inhale or on exhale? Uh, this sounds uh, that you just played sounds like an inhale. Yeah, that's well, that's an excellent question. I have always thought it was exhale, but I guess I have not. Um, the not calls that. Yeah, to, to play the call, you're exhaling, but that just might be how the calls are, are designed. So I'm not sure. I think it's an yeah. exhale because when they, you, you know how I think it's an exhale? In cold weather, uh, steam comes out smoke. their face. Yep, yeah, they, they, I'm trying to think if I could remember that. Yep. And, but I do have grunt calls that you can uh, call inhale or exhale. Okay. It's a, yeah, slightly different pitch. I don't know if it's got a different read in there, but you can you can uh do it and also sometimes bucks will just do such a short grunt that it just sounds like a click and then it sound it could be any number of noises that come from the woods if you just hear a couple of clicks you know that are like that all right this is probably the second most popular call that hunters use uh, this is a bleat call and so a lot of times this is going to be made to uh, imitate a doe in estrus kind of like a drawn out uh, almost a pleading type bleat uh, sometimes people will also use a higher pitch bleat to sound like a a fawn a first of the year which may be um, of more I guess, attention to bring the attention of does. Um, it's not a call I've used a lot personally. If I carry a call, it's a grunt tube or a rattling antlers. And I, I think it's probably more for me than it is for deer. But this, this one is a, a popular one. And the nice thing about this is you can't mess it up because this little tube that we've got the picture of here, all you do is turn it over. That, that's all you have to do when you turn it over there's something in there that's like gravity fed and by pulling down and pushing air through there it, it makes a doe bleat and we'll go ahead and play this sound so you can hear what it sounds like <laughs> So yeah, it's not um, not dissimilar from the grunt, but it's obviously higher pitch, more drawn out, and uh, you can even kind of the intensity of that uh, gets further drawn out and more pleading as the doe gets into estrus. So uh, when we really start getting close to that, like November 10th to 14th date, um, a call like this could be of interest to bucks if they if they think that there's a you know, a doe in estrus that somebody else has missed. So not something I've tried a lot, but if it, uh, like everything on here, if it's something that gives you confidence, then it's, then it's worth it. Jason, have you ever tried these out in the field? Yeah, I've had one of these since they came out. I think when I was about 14 or so, this might be one of the first calls I ever got just because of the, the dumb factor of it all or the idiot proof factor of it all. I mean, when I was a kid, my dad gave me that and was like, here you go, play with this. And uh, so it definitely, um, 
it definitely kept me in the woods longer, I guess you'd say. I can't remember it. I've never had luck with Colin. I've always just sat in the right spot and, and been lucky. But um yeah, my dad has really good luck with Colin. He'll put out scents and call and he'll get he'll he'll have a lot of action through through all these different types of calls. He'll he's out there with all kinds of gear. But uh I'm more of a sit and wait type of person. But um no, I'll pull this out if I'm bored and just uh just do a couple. Um <coughs> excuse me. But yeah, um, it's reminds me. I think the person who made it has made a million bucks off this idea. And literally, I remember when I was a little kid, there used to be a thing called a cow in a can that you see at like yeah. the old magic shops or gag shops, and uh, and they just took that idea and put put deer on it and and sold a bunch of them. So good for them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great! The guy made a million dollars. No, that's no, that's a good point though about the kids. Like uh, kids like stuff to to play with right and especially if it's something that they feel might impact the hunt so that's a good strategy if you're taking a kid along and and you're worried about them losing interest as soon mm -hmm. as you see them start lose interest like oh here you know turn this call over and and uh, watch the deer come in even if you don't believe that to be true if the kid does and it uh, sparks up their their interest for another 30 minutes or so then it's um mission accomplished right Oh, for sure. My, I mean, we did that with rattling too. I mean, my dad's oh, like, yeah. all right, kick all the leaves around and you just sit there and flail around. And that's definitely something for, for a kid to help out with. At least it's like shake and bake. And for I sure. helped. You got to remember hunting's supposed to be uh, relaxation, supposed to be fun. You know, some people uh, get so far into it. They're like, oh man, I accidentally uh, washed my hunting clothes with regular laundry detergent and I didn't put it in its sent away bag right away my season's mm -hmm. ruined you know like sometimes I, I feel like we got to remember lighten up just go in the woods and have some fun and and um, more often than not you're going to have an adventure out there for sure yeah and I mean I'm, I'm such a proponent of saying to not take it so seriously because I think people taking it seriously lead to people taking really bad shots and that's what I'm I'm really against and it's that's something that I personally had to learn from being a teenager growing up um, Did not take, don't take, <clears throat> there's always going to be a next time. Do not, don't take it so sure. seriously where you have to get where you're looking at that day and um, be safe and whatnot and make your right, make, make good calls when you're trying to shoot these deer. But um, anyway, snort, squeeze, snort, snort, squeeze, snort, wheeze. <laughs> Go ahead, Curtis. Snort, wheeze. Yeah, this is the one you, uh, some people will carry this call because it's kind of known as a dominant buck call. And um, so this is a call you don't ever want to do if you are happy with basically any buck, because if you make this call, every buck within earshot other than the one dominant buck is probably running away. Um, so yeah, this, this is an advanced call. This is one we definitely don't recommend uh, people to use, but in the unique circumstance, if you are hunting a dominant buck and you do have one that's hung up and nothing else is working, this is like the Hail Mary of the Hail Mary, I feel like, because this is a call. I, I've never used it in real life. i I do have one somewhere. I don't even know where it is. I don't usually carry it with me, but it, yeah, I've heard that if you do this, when a dominant buck is hung up, he's going to come in looking to fight and, and it works really well under that one unique circumstance. Now, if you think it's the dominant buck, cause it's a really nice eight pointer, maybe he's 130 and you blow this, but you didn't know about the 150 10 point that comes out at night that eight pointer is going to run for the hills and you're going to be uh, pretty bummed that you blew that call. But let's go ahead and listen to what it sounds like. That's kind of a yeah. short one. Usually it does that and then they do a long blowout too. Yeah. Usually... Gonna, sometimes you'll hear where they do that. Yeah, you know, and then like trail like tra off at the end, kind of like, thing. But kind of like an air brakes coming off a bus or something, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, but so it, it's kind of a variation off the snort blow that we heard earlier, but it's more aggressive, and it, it, it's basically it's like a dominant buck challenge. So this is a call to definitely use very sparingly, but if you're out there trying to hunt the biggest buck in the woods and you just so happen to see him 
this this could actually be a helpful call. It, like I said, I have not done it. I've definitely read of people that have done it and and worked really well. Yeah, and uh, these come with at least back in the in the early two thousands when this call came out. A lot of a lot of deer technology has really grown in the past 20, 30 years, but um for calls and gear and such. Um, but uh, this one used to come with a DVD, and on that DVD, I tell you what, it worked every time. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know. I, I trust stories I read anymore more than the ones I see on, on video. But uh, but yeah, definitely. It's something to for sure know about just in case you hear that sound in the woods because it's yeah. a different. It almost sounds like, uh, I don't know, like you'd think, what is that, a, a macaque or something? You know, a monkey jumping around? Bigfoot, so, man. Yeah, well, that's yeah. Any any unexplained noise gets attributed to Bigfoot, unless you're in the South, then it's Chubacabra. So that's right. Yeah. All right. Rattle call. This this is other than the grunt call. This is definitely the most popular. So this is not a a vocalization, so to speak, but this is the sound of deer bumping their antlers together. And um, we actually we've got a. Uh, I think in our deer scouting video, there's a little clip of a couple young bucks sparring, you know, knocking their antlers together. And, and this is something that's hormone driven. When those hormones get high, they get territorial. Uh, it's the same thing like, um, you know, dance offs, I guess, in middle school nowadays that uh, for human children, but for deer, it's, uh, it's knocking their antlers together. So we can simulate that. People will either take antlers from harvested bucks uh, previously or deadheads that you uh, were able to find and get, get a permit to keep. Um, but one tip for that, if you do use actual antlers, it's better to use the same side. So get two antlers of the same side and then you can hit them together uh, without the tines busting you in the knuckles, right? So if you use like the same, when you hit them together, you may be hitting your knuckles, which, uh, yeah, just using the same side helps to, to minimize that. And I like to drill a hole down in the bottom and um, connect them with string. Just helps you to carry them around. You can throw them over your shoulder, and that way you don't lose one. But they also do have bags. You can see one in the picture there on the bottom left. Um, <clears throat> I assume they're, I think they're just like plastic squares in there. And do they sound 100% perfect? No, but they also don't sound bad. Um, and deer, when their testosterone is going through the roof, you know, I've, I've definitely heard of people who have used the bags and they've come in. So even though it doesn't sound perfect, it seems to sound good enough to, to work given the right time. Uh, but all you do is basically slam that bag together and then move it back and forth in your hands and it makes the same kind of sound as it would if you knock those antlers together. So we'll go ahead and play this sound here. Wrong one. So that was a rattling sequence. In the beginning of that, you hear that snort, yeah. that snort wheeze a little bit better than actually what our example is for the snort wheeze. So you hear that long drawn out note after the we after the wheezing. But yeah. um, I'll play it again, and you guys can hear that again. Yeah, so how definitely. long how, how long would you normally do that for Curtis like I mean how long's too long or too short or or what are you thinking yeah I mean I don't think there's any exact science to it um but for me personally it's it's just a couple seconds you know because then I want to stop and listen and and hear what's out there so if I was doing a little sequence like that I would leave off the snort wheeze usually because I'm okay with the second biggest buck in the woods that's that's right. perfectly fine for me um, but yeah. yeah, you could do the, the grunt and maybe I would just do that just like they did in the video and then rattle about the same amount of time and then maybe be quiet for five minutes and just listen. Mm -hmm. 
And then the two two things I would add to this, Curtis, is uh, with these bags, um, if they don't come with something already to kind of keep them quiet, that this is loud in your pack. So you want to wrap something around there, get a rubber band or a rope or something, a strap, and make sure that these things aren't jostling around in your backpack as you're walking through the woods the first time you take them out because you're going to definitely secure them the next time because they are loud. Um, and then the second thing would be that um, younger bucks might be deterred by this, but... Um, they also come in and watch kind of the fights. Um, so it's kind of like a fight at recess type of thing. So you might be able to see a younger buck come in if you don't care what size deer you're getting. I mean, you might be able to do that and you might not get the biggest deer in the woods, but you might get a, a nice five pointer or something come up and look around and see what's going on. Yeah, curiosity factor. And it's a good tip about the putting something around the rattle bags. I know that a lot of times if you get the, uh, if you go to the, like the sports section of Walmart and they have the wrist straps uh, just to keep sweat from running down your arm. Those usually fit perfectly around the rattle bags and hold them nice and snug. That's good. Yeah, for sure. About the size of a wrist. Sure. All right. I'm going to turn it over to Jason for controlling your scent. Sure. And then um, before I get into scent, we had one question asking about worrying about ticks. Um, and how ticks are becoming worse as time goes on. And you're right. Uh, we actually have a really interesting interview with uh, a doctor here at the U of I. So we're, our program is based out of the University of Illinois. And um, Dr. Uh, Holly Tutton is a tick researcher. Um, so she's an entomologist who uh, goes out and, and surveys the ticks all across Illinois. And uh, they publish their data. And then they kind of look at what tick species are where and then what um, different diseases or, or pathogens they may be carrying and um it's an eye-opening conversation and it will make you want to wear bug spray every time you go out <laughs> um so uh just uh we have tips on that and we have a couple we have a couple uh I'm, i'll ask dan to add that to the email that we send out we have a um a, a, what's it called a handout that kind of an infographic that goes over the different steps on how to do tick prevention but um yeah i mean and also the environment's changing and we're having tick species come in from the south and we're having other tick species come in from the north. I forget the different, I think the Lone Star ticks come in from the south and then uh, yeah. black tick species are coming in from the north. And uh, ticks with the Lyme disease. Yeah. Yep. And I think it's like almost a 50% prevalency rating in a lot of areas for black legged ticks and Lyme disease. So yep. no joke. And yeah. then talking about from the south, that's where you can get, I, I, I think it is the Lone Star Tick, or it might have been one of the others from the south that has or the Gulf Coast. gal syndrome, Yeah, which yep. makes and you then, allergic to red meat, not, not good. Yeah, so we have Alpha Gal coming in from Tennessee and Kentucky area that's coming up our way, and that's, like Curtis said, it's going to make you allergic to red meat, and that's going to be really ironic if you're out there trying to hunt and you get allergic to red meat. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, and then Lyme disease is no joke. And then like uh, spotty mountain rocky spotted fever is coming through and all the other things. So um, prevention for that, um, wear layers um, that are uh, tuck, tuck your shirt into your pants, tuck your pants into your boots. Uh, you can put duct tape around your, your boots and uh, also use a, there's a chemical out there called permethrin or pimethrin. And it does not smell. You can treat your clothes with it. Follow the instructions on the bottle. It is highly toxic to cats while wet. Um, so you can treat your clothes outside and then wait for it to dry and then it should be safe. Um, you can also treat um, your fabric of your car with it. And so if you transport a deer in like the back of an SUV, if you don't have a pickup truck, um, you can treat your, your, your fabric with that and it will kill the ticks on contact. Um, but uh, again, follow all the different, I mean, it is a chemical, so follow the instructions on the bottle, please. Uh, don't be afraid to use bug spray. I watched, um, Holly invited me to go to, 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 not go to, but to watch a presentation from someone else who was doing tick, tick pardon me, guys, doing tick research. And they surveyed hunters, and a lot of the hunters barely did any type of tick prevention. Um, some of them didn't want to use bug spray because of the smell, and they thought that deer would be able to smell them. Uh, if you hunt, upwind the deer won't be able to smell you no matter how stinky you are and you can use bug spray so don't worry about that it's much better to get snorted at than to get lyme disease so um i really don't think that that's really going to impact at all so just put on bug spray use permethrin if you'd like to um and try to t check yourself when you get out of the field and uh also, she said that um, drying your clothes instead of washing your clothes right away, um, heat kills ticks more than they probably survive the wash almost and the, the dryer and the heater 
of the of the dryer would uh, kill your ticks quicker. So if you're really worried about take your clothes off next to the washing machine when you get home and put them in the dryer right away. Yeah, and personally, I know like that's what I do. I treat all my hunting gear, boots, pants, pack, all that stuff with permethrin. Because remember, you're setting your pack on the ground. Ticks can crawl on that. Mm -hmm. uh, permethrin's great. It dries, doesn't have the scent. And then when you get back, you can throw your hunting stuff right in the dryer, kills anything that might be there. And that's going to reduce most of them. But always check right when you get back too, because like uh, Dr. Tutton told us, most of these things, even if you get bit by a tick who has one of these, it, it usually takes time to get that. So if you get the tick off right away, you're going to reduce your chance of getting whatever infection it might have uh, drastically mm -hmm. if you can get it off within, you know, three to four hours of when it latches on. So definitely check. Don't just go right to sleep because when you wake yeah. up and have that itchy spot, that's when you're in trouble. Yep. And, um, and permethrin definitely works. So we went and shot a video earlier this summer and Adam had permethrin on his pants. Dan and I did not, we would walk every couple of steps through this one field and be flicking up uh, literally 70 ticks off of our legs at any given time. I mean, Adam had two on him the whole day, Dan and I, we had to walk 10 yards, flick ticks off 10 yards, take flick ticks off. And it was the, I wish we would have done a video there on the ticks because it would have been a viral video of how many ticks were all over us. It was insane. I've never seen anything like that in my life. Um, all right, moving on. Um, great question. Please. Yeah. Take, take prevention precautions for sure. Okay. So controlling your scent and wind direction. So when you're hunting, you want the wind in your face. Um, our old employee, Adam used to say, you want to smell the deer. You don't want the deer to smell you. So how are you going to smell the deer by having the wind hit you in the face? So, um, that's definitely the number one uh, step into picking out your deer hunting spot every morning, check which way the wind's going, and then use that to help you understand which way you're going to be walking in and which way you're going to be sitting and where you think the deer are going to be coming from and make sure that the wind is in your face. No matter, I'm going to go over a little bit about the different types of uh, scent control. Uh, you could be stinky and sitting there smoking a cigarette like old timers used to and be upwind and you'll be fine. So all this other stuff is this icing on the cake as long as you are upwind. So people store their hunting clothes separately from other clothing that may have um, fabric softener and other smells on it. And uh, also like if you have it in the garage, you might pick up some oil smells or other things that are in your garage. So having them in a separate tote is always a good idea. Um, so it keeps the moisture down, keeps the odor out and, um, keeps it easy to kind of haul, um, from your car. Um, if you have multiple layers that you just keep in your tote, you can throw that in your car and drive to your spot. And, uh, I tend to backpack in a lot of my clothes, especially when it's even cold out. Um, cause I, I'm walking at least a half mile to a mile into my spot and I will have a backpack with my clothing in it. And even if it's very, very cold out, I will be in a t-shirt or a long sleeve shirt and walk in. And then I would take that off when I get to my spot because I'll probably be sweaty. And that's more of a trying to not be cold issue because if you sit at your stand when you're after sweating, uh, it's, a, it's a gonna be a long morning. So um, I always take my wet clothes off and put my new clothes on. And so it's good for scent control. So I'm not having sweat in my clothing, but it's also good for not sitting there freezing uh, during the long cold morning that I might be sitting out there. So remember, be cold on your walk in so you're not cold on your sit. That's yeah, a good tip because most people that freeze out, it's because they they got sweaty in the morning. And then once your body heat lowers, you're like, oh, man, I'm hot, you know, and then your body heat lowers when you're sitting there and all of a sudden you're frozen because your bottom layer is is wet next to your skin. No good. Yep. Yeah. So I have a climbing tree stand and then I actually strap my straps in my backpack through my climbing tree stand. It's a heavy setup, but it, I, I figured it out and I, I, I deal with it. But um, all right. So then uh, some more storage. Con these are like made name brand storage containers. These can vary in price. You can find low end stuff or high end stuff. Uh, like the, I think this top bag here has like a almost like an Ozonics type of a uh, battery pack that you can strap into it. I mean, there's people out there that are willing to buy anything for this type of stuff. Um, but hey, if it works, if you like it, it gives you confidence. All this stuff is about giving you confidence out in the woods and allowing you to sit out there and think that uh, you have a shot of trying to get near these animals. So, um, so yeah, so again, good for traveling. You can put it in your car and uh, store it and not worry about it. Um, some people do this instead of doing any of the other type of treatments. They might just feel that this is good enough. 
You can also add uh, scent into these different containers if it doesn't come with it, if the bag's not scented itself. So a lot of different wood scents. So you have pine, cedar, um, different type of wafers that you can put in your, in your luggage there to keep their scent down and make it smell more natural. You have dryer sheets, of course. Yeah, so people go and they get shampoos and dryer sheets and everything else and deodorants. I mean, there's a huge market out there for reducing people's scent. Um, you can also get the scent lock clothing and uh, other brands that claim that it keeps you from smelling. But uh, again, first tip, hunt upwind and none of this matters. But uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's out there. You want it, go get it. I, I, I'll be honest, um, I don't have the best sense of smell. So out of tradition that my father did and then I do, I do have a type of dirt spray that I spray on my boots and myself. And I just kind of do that just because I've done it the whole time. But uh, it probably doesn't make a difference, <laughs> I imagine. But you never know. It's like with all this stuff, if it gives you confidence, then it, it definitely matters. I feel like even if you use all the scent blocker soap, do everything right, have the most expensive ozonics bag, if you all of those things and a deer comes out downwind of you 40 yards, a lot of times they're still smelling you. If you don't mm -hmm. think so, just watch the hunting shows and you know they're using all that gear and how many times do they still get winded? Um, and then think about the, the great bow hunters from the past um, that never even heard of any of that stuff that might go on a two week hunting trip and, and not take a shower, <laughs> you know, so um, uh, it's all about giving you confidence. Personally, I like the natural, all I use is the natural stuff. So if you're walking by a cedar, grab off a couple boughs, you know, rub them on you. It'll get you smelling nice like cedar and, um, hey, it might give you a little bit more confidence. And even if it doesn't, cedar smells good. So it's, it's not a bad smell to smell the whole day. Yeah, for sure. And, um, and also be weary of some of these uh, products. I remember, again, back in the early 2000s, uh, some type of carbon spray came out and uh, my uncle used that and he sprayed it on his orange and uh, it turned his orange black. <laughs> so, and he couldn't wash it out. So some of it, I don't know if that company's still around or not, but it might be a little, some snake oil there too. So try it out, try it on a piece of fabric you might not worry about uh, before you start spraying your whole suit down. But um, I remember that one too. So yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's whatever you want. It's whatever you, however you feel comfortable as Curtis just said. Um, but now something that does work are these lures. Um, this is going to be something that you're going to want to look into. I think anyway, um, I've had success with this in the past. So um, this is going to be similar to hunting around rut. And so it's going to be late October, early to mid November. And it's going to be going to be sensitive. Well, I'll cover here in a second, but you're going to want to do this over scrapes. Um, you can do a drag line and around your setup. So over scrapes, uh, you're going to want to put in, these are like your dough and heat and your buck urine. Um, so buck urine or even uh, people urine. Some people do that as well. Um, if it's a urine, that's not the buck um, own, or it might get uh, territorial and start looking around and try to see what's going on with that. So um, you can put a dominant buck or a dough and heat in a buck scrape. Um, a scrape is an area where deer will scratch a surface on the ground and then they usually have a licking branch, which this buck is currently licking in the photograph here. And they'll come over and check that out. And they have a bunch of those around the woods. And it's basically a big message board for the deer community in the woods to kind of see who's where and what's going on. And I have, I've had trail cameras on these before and you can see bucks pee and you can see does pee in them. And uh, if you had dough and heat, you could go there, drop some dough and heat, um, put maybe a, a cotton swab with dough and heat on it and tie it to a string, drag it behind you. So that's what a drag line is. And then you can drag that over and down the trail that you expect the deer to walk. And then that way you can shoot them off that trail. So drag lines totally work. Um, you can definitely get some luck with that. And then you might want to do a cover scent around your setup. Um, so you can do dough and heat uh, around your setup if you like and hang some cotton swabs or other things from the trees. Um, just make sure you pick those up. There's been so many times we go back into the woods and find a spot where a hunter was at and you see these cotton swabs just hanging from branches that are years old. Um, so make sure you remember where you put them and pick them up before you leave. And you can also do cover scents, which I'll go over, but they have like calming scents and deer bed scents and things like that. So not quite a lure, but a cover scent. So I may have summarized all my scents already, but we'll go through them anyway. Um, so the lures, like I said, it's going to be your doe and estrus and, um, and then your uh, buck and rut scents and then your calming scents, like I said. 
So here are those cotton swabs that I talked about. And um, they also have these other ones that come in aerosol. So they have like Buck Bomb is a company that came out. And also these smoking sticks. Uh, my family's had luck with smoking sticks before, but make sure you do this in an area where you're not going to start a forest fire because basically you're starting an incense smoking stick and you can put a can over that that has holes in it. So that way the smoke builds up inside the can and then the smoke will be taken downwind. Um, and my dad and I myself have have uh, every hunting story I have is about my father, but hey, that's what hunting's about. Um, it's about having family. But um, we would always have him go and we've had bucks walk right up that smoke trail right to where we we're heading. Uh, right heading right for us but um so these are the different things that are out there they all work pretty well honestly um so uh and it's pretty it's not that the, all the dough and urine the dough and heat stuff is really not going to scare anything away the buck scents are going to be a little bit more of a possible scare another smaller buck away type of thing and then the calming sense is a calming scent and it doesn't really scare anything away so safe bet would be the dough and estrus and your calming scents going a little bit more aggressive is going to be putting out some buck buck scent and try to get one of those dominant bucks to come in. Anything to add to that, Curtis? Well, just to keep in mind that the nose is the, like, you know, we think about the world as people and our eyes are our biggest asset. So we think about seeing the world. If deer, were, were, they would talk about smelling the world. You know, they don't use their eyes nearly the same way that we do. They they basically go around the world using their nose to see it. And so that's one of the reasons why these scents can be really effective, especially in that pre-rut period, last couple of weeks of October, first week of November. And, um, and like Jason said, nothing is going to be afraid of doe estrus. It's not like another doe is going to smell it and run away or anything like that. So there's really no reason not to do it. I guess the only reason I could ever think of is if you were in an area that gets hunted really hard, um, I, I think there can be a time where deer can start to pick out some of these senses, meaning there's a hunter there, just like ducks might uh, see a spinning wing decoy and know there's hunters there. So there may be some aspect of that if your competition is really high, but uh, for the most part, I every time it gets to pre-rut at some point, I'm going to bust out the sense uh, just to re-up my own, um, you know, motivation in my spot. And I like to use the drag line, like Jason said, because it's easy to do. Just kind of drag it from where you are to where you're basically you want your shot to be. And um, hey, it's one one extra thing that can help bring deer to you. Yep. And I shot a deer last year. That was, it was not this, this large of a buck, but uh, I did have a scent out, a scent wick out and uh, I shot it while it was at my scent wick. So I knew it was in range. I knew exactly the range of that scent wick. And it was basically like the deer stepped on the X. I'm like, perfect. And that's the deer I got last year. Uh, so it's a great way to get a deer to stop where you want them to also. Yep. So yeah, we didn't really mention that, but yeah, that's great. If you got that one opening right at 19 yards, X marks the spot, do what Jason did and maybe Maybe he'll stop right there. Mm -hmm. For sure. All right. Um, now I'm going to go, if anyone has any questions about sense or uh, suggestions, but also the, the price range on anything that we're talking about today, we're not sponsored by anything really at all. No, no equipment sponsors yet, <laughs> but uh, we're partners, but uh they, they vary in ranges. And I mean, you can have success with cheap stuff as much as you can the expensive stuff. I mean, I went to, to Field and Stream last year and there was, I mean, it, it went from anywhere from 10 bucks to 20 bucks up to over $50 for dough and estrus scent. I mean, I don't know what's in that $50 bottle compared to the other ones, but uh, I'm not, I'm not putting out 50 bucks for that. Uh, but anyway, so uh, going into stands. So this is going to be a ladder stand. It's very traditional. This is not going to be something that you're going to want to set up in the morning, uh, the morning of your hunt. Uh, people have done that, but uh, that's asking a lot. So you might want to go out there a couple of weeks beforehand and put this up and let deer get used to it a little bit. Uh, so this is really good for private land. A lot of public land, you can't really leave your, your ladder stands out on. You have to look at your local regs if you're going out on public land for that. But if you have a private land set up and you want to put a couple of these around your property, go for it. Uh, when I was growing up, I had one of these and we had it up for from when I was 12 to when I was at least 20 and the tree actually started growing into the different parts of the ladder stand because we had never moved it. So uh, if you got a good spot, it's a good thing to kind of set up and you'll have that every year to go, go sit at. 
And then uh, these are really nice because you can get a two person one. So if you're, you're, you want to hunt with a friend or if you have a kid that you like to take out with you, um, you can definitely sit together and uh, be pretty safe in these. So, um, so yeah, so it's a nice little beginner stand for people, uh, getting on and off the ladder for, for younger kids might be a little tricky or scary, but make sure you guys are wearing your safety harnesses when we talk about all this, all these stands and, uh, always have three points of contact going up the ladder and be safe going up there. So the cons to those are that they're very heavy and they take a while to set up. Uh, pros is that they're usually pretty comfortable and uh, you can sit uh, multiple people in there if you'd like to. Then there are climbing tree stands. Um, this is one that I particularly use. Um, they do, they are kind of heavy compared to the next setup that I'm gonna talk about. Uh, they are two parts. So you kind of climb up the tree, similar to this photograph here, you strap your feet into the bottom section and then you sit uh, on, you, you put your weight on the outside. So that way, as you sit down, the teeth or um, the, the pads dig into the tree and support your weight. And then you inchworm yourself up the tree. So the pros of this is that you're mobile and you can set up in a lot of different places. Uh, these seats tend to be very comfortable, uh, almost too comfortable. You may fall asleep in one of these. Make sure you're strapped in if that happens. And uh, the cons would be that you need to climb up trees that are straight and that don't have large branches sticking out halfway up. So you can't un unhook this and then rehook it over a tree limb. Um, that'd be very dangerous. So you're going to have to find a trees that are similar to like a telephone pole and go up those and you can go up as high as you'd like. So you're not limited to, to height. Um, I'd keep it around anywhere from as, as low as 10 feet. I mean, there's, there's some spots if you're in um, leaf cover. Another thing to think about as you're setting up your tree stand is to have something behind you that blocks your silhouette. So in this case, I mean, I this guy's kind of an open for the photograph here, but if you want to count the, the leaf cover on the trees behind him, if you're a deer looking up, you'd be blocked off by that. I like having a small tree next to me that might have some, some leaves and, and it's a little sapling next to me that I'm kind of sitting in, but uh, that's always good to have. So make sure there's something that blocks you up, but you can, you can get up to 10 feet, but you can also go all the way as high as 30 feet uh, to get a shot and just make sure you know how you're shooting from there with your angles, because it does change the higher up you go. Uh, so just something to consider. Um, and always a safety tip is to always be harnessed in and also have your pieces connected because if you don't have your pieces connected and the bottom falls out, you're stuck. So this was actually sent to us by one of our participants. Um, they, they forward this over to us. And if you're sitting there, usually when you're starting to head down, it's going to be dark out. So, uh, you're going to be sitting up there for a while and hopefully you have cell phone service. If you don't have a way to get that bottom piece back up to you, uh, you could try to, I wouldn't suggest it. This is not, I'm not even going to suggest it. Never mind. You're kind of stuck up there. You can try to kind of put your feet against there and wiggle your way down, but that's very dangerous. Um, luckily this person was able to hook, uh, their toe up line was able to kind of snag their bottom piece and pull it up and they were able to get out, uh, without any issue, but, it just takes a little piece of rope to tie that's about the length of your leg because you want to be able to move those two pieces without being hung up um, to um, keep this from happening. So it's a very easy fix to make sure this never happens again. Next one is this is going to be the lightest setup and the most um, durable, not well, not durable, but um, able to be put up on any tree really um, that is safe to climb that's alive because you don't have to worry about branches. The sections of ladder that you strap to the tree are small in a way and can go from one side of the tree to the other side of the tree that you can climb most trees. So this is called a hang and hunt tree stand system. It usually involves um, these sticks that vary in length. Um, you can get ones that are three rung or five rung and they pack up real nice, just like this pack is down here. And the seat and the, the platform that you stand on are uh, usually connected. And this is good if you are doing vertical bow archery out of it. Um, so there won't be any part of the tree stand really preventing you from swinging your bow around. Uh, and it's, it's very light. The only downside really is how comfortable are you climbing sticks? I mean, everyone should be wearing their safety harness and you can climb any of this stuff safely as long as you have your harness on. But uh, 
is there's still kind of a vertigo factor with this. So it usually takes three to four sticks to get up to a uh, hunting height. And um, yeah, anything to add to this, Curtis? Which one of these do you tend to use? Well, I hunt from the ground a lot more uh, these days, but I, sure. I, I have used all of these basically i do have a climbing stand they all have their pluses and minuses mm -hmm. i like how these hang and hunt tree stands they're mobile and you can like jason said hunt in basically any tree because when i first went to college in northwest missouri state i had my old man climbing deer stand and i was uh hunting bilby ranch a property out there and i walked around all day and never found a single tree i could put my climbing tree stand in uh, and, and so a couple of weeks later, when I saved up enough money, I bought a, a double bull hunting blind. And mm -hmm. so I've been using that a lot because it, it's just, I can put it anywhere. It's lightweight and I'm mobile. I like being mobile. So mm -hmm. I, you haven't quite got to the blind part yet, but I like my double bull more than I use it more than anything else, just because it's quicker, easier. I don't have to climb a tree. And mm -hmm. as an added bonus, I got a blind around me, so I don't have to be quite as still as I would if I was sitting up in, in one of these. Sure. Um, yeah, we're going to get into ground hunting here in a couple slides. Uh, so, then, um, so then tree saddles, um, I think these have been around for longer than we think they have been, but they're really hitting the market hard now. A lot of the TV shares are picking these up. Uh, you're basically, you use the the same type of ladder setup that we, was for the hang and hunt system to get up the tree. But then when you get up there, instead of sitting in that uh, kind of folding chair setup, you're just sitting there in a glorified safety harness. That's really comfortable. Uh, apparently, I've never used one of these. Um, the price range for these are actually quite high for just being a couple straps and some fabric. Uh, but this is definitely uh, something that is is hot right now for the deer hunting community. Um, so it's as you see it, you're just kind of in that safety harness. It allows you to kind of to move from one side of the tree to the other side of the tree, and gives you free to, free of motion. And they're safe because you're basically just already in your safety harness, so you're really not going to fall out of that. Super lightweight and another plus for them. And I haven't used them yet either because they are expensive. I probably. We'll get one at some point, but they're also quiet. Mm -hmm. It's pretty hard to attach metal stands to a tree or go up in a metal climber without making some sound. But uh, as I understand it, these saddles with basically no metal parts are are really, really quiet. No, for sure. Yeah, I, I definitely have made some loud metal clangs in the in the morning with my climber. Um, so yeah, yeah, super, super lightweight, like, like Curtis said. So if you're going to do some backcountry hunting or some, some camping out, go down to the Shawnee, go camping for a couple days, it'd be kind of, it'd be fun to have one of these with you and you'd be walking around for a couple miles. Yeah, if you go far enough West to be in grizzly country, just make sure you're high enough not to be a bear pinata. That, that <laughs> would be bad. <laughs> uh, yep. And then, so just always be safe. And, um, I know. The last person I knew who fell out of a tree was another uncle. I have a lot of uncles, um, and he was he was hurt pretty bad. So uh, just make sure you have your harness on. Um, it's not manly anymore to not have a safety harness. I mean, come on, let's go. Uh, that's the number one, I think, hunting accident is going to be in and out of the woods and falling out of tree stands and, and going up and going down tree stands. So uh, it's so easy to just take the precautions you need to take to make sure that this never happens to you. So now ground blinds. Um, so Curtis has said how much he enjoys hunting out of his ground blind. Uh, Curtis, do you have any tips on setting up a ground blind? Everybody always wonders how, like, if you need to have it out there for weeks or days or, or what kind of uh, tips you have for that? Yeah, that's that's probably best if you have that option. Um, I do not because I'm primarily hunting public land. So I bring my blind in and out every day and I have definitely shot several deer out of it. Um, so I like to put it, I like to find places, if you can find a fence row, and I know that uh, most fence rows are filled with invasive species that we don't like, but one good thing about all the Russian olive, autumn olive, and stuff like that is it hides blinds really well, and it's almost the right height that if you tuck it back in there, a lot of the overhanging branches are right up over the roof of your blind, 
and it's broken up and I can uh, pull a couple other branches around and clear out my windows and make it where um, basically the blind is broken up. So I kind of treat it like the same way you were talking about yourself when you're going up. If you can break up your silhouette, I try to break up the silhouette of the blind some which way or how by tucking it into bushes like that. Um, and, and yeah, if I can do that, I've had number of deer walk right by me all sides even occasionally downwind and not see me smell me you know anything like that so definitely not trying to say that ground blinds are better than being in the air I really do like being up in a stand because you get more visibility you're going to see way more deer mm -hmm. bar none you're going to see way more deer in a stand than you will in a grind, ground blind not because there's more deer there but because you can see better no, for sure. Um, so, yeah, I definitely. I'm not trying to say ground blinds the way to go, but for me, if I'm trying to hunt quick, don't know where I'm going, want to be mobile, and I'm not the best at sitting still, um, ground blinds a good choice for me. Yep. And on public land, you can't break branches or anything like that, but you can use dead branches. So um, whatever is on the ground already, you can use that to help brush in or blind non woody vegetation. Yep. So um, yeah, if it's it, like yeah uh anything i don't know what it's technically if it's woody stems less than your finger width or something like that but usually you can use non-woody vegetation to kind of brush in your blind a little bit mm -hmm. for sure and you can be successful honey on the ground um i know i've I, i've hunted on the ground uh, there's a photo of me down here uh this one year was crazy uh this is when i got two deer in a half hour i was out with a friend and and uh, i shot a doe first and then uh a little buck came by and it was late season. It was a uh, muzzle loader season. That's why I'm wearing orange. And uh, I got my old crossbow there and uh, we had two deer come down within a half hour of each other. And uh, so we, I took both of those and I was literally sitting with just a couple like logs about the size of an arm that were crisscrossed in front of me and with our backs against the tree. So our silhouette was, was not being able to be seen. And they both came within 30 yards of us and uh, I was able to get them both. And so as long as you are upwind and not moving and have your silhouette broken up, you can definitely hunt from the ground uh, pretty successfully. For sure. The ultimate in mobility. And think about uh, people like Fred Bear, some of the greatest bow hunters of all time. He never, almost never hunted out of the stand. It was usually from the ground and usually just wearing a plaid shirt. So um, yeah, I, thinking about which camo is the best or all this sort of things. Um, I mean, sure, does that stuff help? It can, but you don't have to do that to be a successful deer hunter, not at all. <clears throat> the benefits of the ground blind, of course, you can get away with more movement, but if you really wanna be the ultimate in mobility, go out with nothing like that and uh, like Jason said, a lot of times you can find a down log or something that can kind of act like a little natural blind. Sure. Or a lot of times people will just straight up hide behind a couple trees and then you're super mobile. And when the deer does come in, if you can position yourself right behind the tree, you might be able to draw. There's one of the bow hunters from the hunting public is almost primarily a just from the ground hunter and, and he's quite successful with it. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. And um, we had one question asking if uh, we need to mark our blinds with blaze orange if we're inside of them. And uh, during uh, rifle or shotgun season, you do need a mark if you're using a blind, uh, have at least 400 inches of orange uh, outside on top of the blind. So that way people out there hunting can see you uh, during archery season. I do not think that's a requirement. Um, but it's also a good idea to have um, just because uh, deer see orange as kind of a brown green, so they really can't see it. So um, it doesn't hurt to have a little bit of orange on top of your, your blind every time you're out in it. Um, so that way people can see it and, and kind of see. I, I, whenever I come across a blind in the woods too. To alert other hunters. Yeah, you know? I've stumbled across blinds by accident before, and it would have been nice to know that it was there. So having a little bit of orange on there during archery season, I would have stayed way more clear of it than me just popping out right in front of them. Um, so I feel bad. And also my safety's in jeopardy because I don't know who's in that blind and how, how, uh, how they're, uh, 
discipline is when it comes to shooting at sounds are. <laughs> so you want to make sure that when you're walking through the woods that it's safe for everybody that if we know where each other are. So for sure, definitely mark your blind. All right, uh, Curtis is going to take us through after the shot. All right, so this is the point that we're trying to get to. Uh, this is after uh, what we hope is a successful shot. Now, first thing I want to say, uh, this is for archery hunters. I like having arrow wraps, and one of the main reasons, uh, other than being able to find my arrows, is it allows me to see where I hit the deer. I have all of my hunting arrows have a white arrow wrap just on the last um you know maybe like four inches of the arrow shaft where the veins are and that really helps me pinpoint where my arrow hit because where you hit uh if you can determine that that's gonna really lay out your your next step so um and we're focused on archery now it's kind of the same process with with firearms although obviously you're not watching the projectile go through the air at that point. So you're going to have to use uh, clues like maybe you see uh, where the hit hit the animal when it's running away, or you can get up and look at the blood. We see in this picture in the lower right, you see like those bubbles. It's a nice bright red blood, almost a little pink in there. This is very, uh, we feel pretty confident that we got lung hit with all those uh, bubbles in the bright red, pinkish red blood. That's a good sign. That's generally the shot that I'm always going for is double lung. Um, the lungs are the biggest vital organ. So you've got the most leeway, basically. A lot of people will talk about heart shots, head shots, neck shots, um, while all of those can be obviously fatal shots and be very quick and, and clean kills, um, there's also more of a chance things can go wrong. It's a smaller uh, target. You've got less room for error. And then neck shots, basically everything that's vital in the neck is a linear target. So if you're off by half an inch one way or the other, it's now not a vital shot. So um, and this is a good representation of that. So double lung is where you always want to go. Now that's the ideal scenario. Maybe we saw our arrow hit. We we find the blood with the good good red pink blood with bubbles. Um, it, it's not always exactly like that. We might find a darker red blood without bubbles, meaning maybe more of a liver shot just behind the the lungs there, kind of that purplish region. Um, <clears throat> that's also 99% always going to be a fatal shot. The deer might go a little bit further. It might be more of a tracking job, but still a good shot when you miss them a little bit for, further back. Now, if you miss them a little further back than that and low, that's one of the worst shots that, that uh, bow hunters can have. That's the paunch shot. If you hit basically just the stomach, and here you'll find the blood. Sometimes you'll find vegetative matter, some like green stomach contents, um, and, and it can smell bad too. Sometimes your arrow will smell bad after a gut shot. And these, um, these are usually fatal for the deer as well, but a lot of times they can take an entire day on up to three or four days before the deer expires. So these, these are kind of the worst of the worst um, when it comes to bow hunting. Definitely not a shot you want to take. And that's one of the reasons why I don't go for heart shots because I don't want to aim that low. Because if I'm a little far back, I might hit the paunch. I kind of aim a little bit more mid-body, kind of the middle of those lungs. Because if I miss by about five inches in any direction, guess what? I'm still in the lungs. So a, a lot of a lot of leeway for error there. That's what I like. Now always mark mark your blood. You, you're excited after your shot, no matter what your blood looks like. You go out, you find your blood, mark your last spot. You got a hat on. Maybe you take your hat on and or off and set it on there. Some which way so you mark it. Don't ever get um, too cocky where you think, oh, this is a great blood trail because next thing you know, maybe you lost it. Now it's dark. 
you're spinning circles. Maybe now you've messed up your blood trail. You may never find that deer. So it's important to do things right from the get go. And that means move slow. Look at the blood, study it, try to try to see, does this look like lung blood? Does it look like it's further back? Does it look, is there any hair to give me indication of where the deer might have been hit? Gather all the clues that you can, almost like you're a CSI investigator, you know, trying to put this thing together and then slowly methodically track. And if you have a GPS, this is a great time to have it out. You can not only mark your blood on your GPS, but you can also keep track of your tracks so that when it comes time uh, that maybe you didn't find the deer on the first pass, you can go back and search different areas or easily go back to the last place you found blood and, and try to establish a direction of travel. Because sometimes if the hit's not ideal, uh, that blood trail may dry up at some point. And at that point, you're going to be switching to more of a grid search uh, with a direction of travel. Or this would be if you're going to utilize a tracking dog, this would be the time to pull out. Try not to mess up the scent beyond where your blood goes and, and contact somebody with a tracking dog right away to hopefully be able to locate that animal. Anything to add to that, Jason? Here's some nice pictures of what blood looks like on the arrow. Um, yeah, just that it's, this, uh, this can be when a deer falls and you see it fall or, you know, you made a good hit. It's awesome. But anytime you got to track a deer and everyone, if you hunt long enough is eventually going to have to track a deer and, uh, it can just be some of the, the worst feeling in the world, knowing that you wounded an animal and you can't find it right away. And, uh, one would be, don't give up too soon. Um, some people just kind of like, can't find blood right away. And they're like, oh, I must've missed it or something like that. But uh, there's a good chance that you probably hit it and you should look around and, and it's now your responsibility to, to find this animal. I mean, you, you took the shot. Now it's your responsibility to do the rest of it. Um, don't, don't give up too quick. And then uh, don't be afraid to call friends um, to come out and help you. Even non hunters can come out and help you try to find blood. Um, be, be careful where you walk. Um, just like Curtis said, do CSI. And um, as you find your blood, you have one friend kind of stay with the last blood and have the other friend walk very slowly um to try to find the next spot of blood and then uh uh what else um yeah give it time i mean even when you make a good shot like i last year i could not find a deer and i made a good shot what i thought was a good shot um i had bubbles my arrow looked like this up here the top arrow had bubbles i had bubbles on on leaves and uh but it it, I never found that deer and we tracked it. I might've tracked it too soon. Like I might've thought that and I didn't give it the time it needed. And, uh, I went out for about two hours. I shot around seven and then I was out till about nine. My flashlight light started dying. I had a buddy, I was hunting 40 minutes away from champagne. So I had a buddy show up with flashlights around nine o'clock. And then we were out tracking that deer till two o'clock in the morning. And, uh, we had last blood. And then the next day, uh, Curtis and Adam, uh, our old employee here, um, came out and tried to help me look for it too. And we found maybe one more spot after that. So at least I know that me and the first guy looked as long as we could. Um, but it's just a, such a horrible feeling and we can't find them. So uh, take your time, uh, give it the time it needs. Don't rush it. Even if, and, and if you don't have, if you have a plans that night and you want to go out or something, don't shoot that deer that day. Because if you got, if you mess up, if it's like getting close to the end of light and you don't have the time to spend the rest of the night looking after a deer or trying to get a deer out of the woods, uh, then you do, then you're done for the night. So just, just make sure you understand how long of a process this is going to take, because even when you do get them right away, then the field dressing process and getting them out of the woods is, is another hour to two hours, depending on how far into the woods you are. So, um, just keep that in mind as you're maybe going out for your first deer, um, that the work is starting literally when you pull that trigger or let go of that arrow. For sure. Yeah, that's all, <clears throat> all good tips that you want to think about that stuff before you let the arrow fly. Cause like Jason said, once you let it fly, now you have to answer for it. And, and that's, that, that even goes beyond ethics. Obviously, ethically, you, you need to make every effort to retrieve that animal, but it's also legally, um, it says right in the IDNR handbook, um, hunters have to make every effort to retrieve wounded game. So, um, 
if you don't, you're flat out breaking the law and, and you're also breaking ethics. So not good for a number of reasons. Um, but it generally, it, when you, the worse hit you got, the longer you're going to wait before you actually start chasing that animal. And the reason is if you do get that paunch shot, which you see the picture there, it looks nasty, looks gross, um, smells horrible. You're going to want to wait probably six hours before you even attempt to go after that deer. And you may want to go ahead and line up a dog if you think that's where you hit uh, from the get-go. And you do have a good shot of recovering that. What, what's bad is you don't want to push that animal. Um, so if you do shoot it through the paunch, it's not going to be feeling good. It's going to go off three, 400 yards away and probably bed down. And one of two things can happen. Either something's going to bump up that wounded deer and it's going to take off for who knows where, in which case it'll probably never be recovered, or it'll stay there and never get up because it'll expire right there in that bed. And if that happens, you do have a good shot of, of recovering it if you give it the time to expire and don't, don't bump it up while it still has the energy to move. And that's the timing here that you see liver shot, heart, lungs, that stuff. You can go start looking at for it after an hour or three hours, like it says. Um, anything other than that, start hitting the paunch further back or just a flesh wound. And yeah, you better, you're going to be giving that deer about six hours or so before you even go after it. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of archery hunters don't start hunting October 1st, at least not if it's warm. I know I don't, because if I do get a bad hit, um, like, yeah, that, that's double horrible. Because now you're thinking, even if the deer did expire right away and I recover it, it's been 80 degrees. So how much of that deer is recoverable? You know, for me, it's just not worth hunting when it's warm, uh, just to have to deal with that stuff. That's my personal choice. Uh, definitely hunt starting October 1st if you want to, but I kind of wait till it gets a little cooler. And most of it is is just in case something goes wrong. That's a very good tip, Curtis. A lot of people don't think, I mean, that's just stuff you learn over time and, and maybe not something that people think about right away. It might not be obvious to some folks. But um, we did get a question about uh, if deer are more dangerous wounded. And um, so if you are tracking a deer and or if you if maybe you uh, we had uh, as an example, a spine shot, which does happen sometimes where the deer might be uh, might fall down right in front of you, but still be alive and might need to take a second shot to um, dispose of the animal. Uh, I find that if you can take that shot without walking up on the deer and without them seeing you, it's much safer for you and the animal. Um, I've heard stories of people walking up on a deer to, to kind of finish it off and uh, it's seeing them and then flailing and making it much harder for them to put the animal down. Um, so if you can get a second shot from your tree stand, if the deer has no idea that you're there and you have a safe, clean shot from your tree stand and try to put another shot on the animal, go for that because it's going to be safe for you and safe for the animal again. Um, some other folks uh, may go up and try to, to maybe cut its neck or something like that. Um, which is it will will work, but you're also risking yourself uh, getting kicked or if it's a buck getting gored um, while doing that. So long, I, I would suggest shoot, get close to it if you can um, to get a good shot on the animal, but to take a shot without the animal knowing that you're there personally. Uh, Curtis, do you have any tips on that? Well, just, yeah, since I have captured deer alive before, well, one of the things to keep in mind is how powerful their legs are. A lot of you know how fast deer are, how uh, high they can jump. So just imagine how strong their legs must be. Then imagine that their hoof is just like the hard end of a baseball bat. And so getting kicked full speed by a deer would be about the same as me taking a baseball bat and just whacking you straight in the chest with it. Not good. So that that's the dangerous part. I've never once heard of a deer like attacking somebody when it's injured because deer, I mean, yeah, when they see a person, it's fear. They're getting away, but it would be like Jason said, if you get too close and get inadvertently kicked or something like that, heck yeah, you can get injured. So stay, stay out of uh, their reach to, for that shot, I would say, if at all possible. Mm -hmm. And if you do get a chance to capture deer, 
um, give them respect because even though they're not like a lion that's going to bite your hand off, like I said, if you take one of those shots to the chest, I mean, it's it's like getting thumped with a baseball bat. So not not fun at all. All right. So we talked about this a little bit. A GPS is definitely your friend here, but it's not mandatory. But mark where your blood is, because especially at night, it's easy to get turned around. And if you if you only have a couple spots of blood and you accidentally walk over it and turn those leaves over, then you may have doomed your chance of ever finding the deer. So the tracking deer is all about slow methodical and like Jason said call your friends you know most uh, most people like this is something exciting I know when I get a call that somebody um, has shot a deer and they need help tracking it I mean that's fun you get to go out in the woods at night with flashlights and hopefully try to find a deer uh, sounds like an adventure to me and I know a lot of people uh, like to get those calls so definitely don't feel bad about calling your your friends to to help with that and also dogs, tracking dogs. There are, um, you know, you can find, I'm not sure where, if there's a consolidation point where they're all listed, but you can find uh, dog tracking groups on social media and online where you can pay somebody some money. They can come out with their dog that's really good at just finding deer and, um, and use those. So definitely keep, if that's something you're uh, you have in the back of your mind you don't want to look around for the deer a lot yourself because all you're doing is messing up the scent trail for the dog if you're going to do that the best bet is to to do it right away and um, you have a good shot of finding the deer uh, and yeah remember the temperature like I was talking about anything up over 40 degrees bacteria starts to starts to build so if you have a night above 40 degrees, the clock is ticking. If that deer is expired, uh, you know that you need to find it as soon as possible, really within three to four hours and get those guts out. Otherwise, you're probably going to lose some meat. It probably won't be all of it. Uh, the first things that'll go will be like the little inside tenderloins that run that you get from the inside. Uh, if you leave those guts in there for three, four hours, something like that, those are not going to be good. And then kind of the, <clears throat> I guess the, the rotting will spread from there. So then the next things will to go will be the actual back straps. Uh, the front legs, back legs might still be good. But um, again, it, it's one of the reasons why I really try to wait until it's right around that 40 degree mark to hunt. And it's because it gives me so much more leeway to find the deer, take care of the meat, all those things. Uh, my personal decision, but remember above 40 degrees, uh, if it's raining, water also promotes bacteria growth. So other things to think about. And then coyotes, we've got a whole lot of coyotes here in Illinois. So if your deer does expire and you're planning on finding it in the morning, just know that you might not be the only creature looking for that animal. And by the time you find it, um, there may not be as much left as, as what you saw the night before. Mm -hmm. No, I've definitely heard of coyotes uh, finding a deer before the hunter did the next day. Um, and then rain also washes away blood trails too. So that's something to consider as you're, as you're looking and the storm clouds are coming in. It's, it's not a good feeling to have. Oh yeah, or snow covering it. Yeah, and then um, and this photograph is a little graphic. I mean, that's a that's a perfect blood trail. I mean, you can kind of see where it goes, but this also gives you an idea of what to look for. Like, if you're looking at blood trail and you feel like you made a good hit, um, and you're seeing drops here and there. Um, don't forget to you can look down, but also look up because I believe. I mean, my guess is that this is probably the white of the deer's belly laying down over here. If not, that's what it tends to look like. So look up in the woods and see if you can see it laying down as you get in a, maybe an opening and scan the horizon that you can see, and you might be able to see it ahead of you. When a blood trail in, sounds like a, a poem, um, <laughs> but usually this is a bad feeling when it happens to you out in the woods, and Jason kind of talked about a time it happened to us last year, and sometimes this even happens with really good blood trails. You're following what looks like an awesome blood trail, and then boom, a clot or something and the blood trail's just gone that's mm -hmm. a bummer 
don't give up. You know, this is the time if you're going to get a dog, okay, back out and line up your dog. If you're not going to get a dog, this is where you even slow down and get more methodical. And this is where you might be on hands and knees looking at every leaf and trying to find just to establish a path of direction. Um, Because maybe you have a really good trail and then it's all of a sudden gone and there's two different ways that it can go. So you really want to find, did it go this way or this way? At that point, your hands and knees, you're trying to find anything. Just the tiniest drop of blood will let you know, okay, it chose this trail rather than this one. And then go on there. Mm -hmm. And anytime you have a split, you're trying to find that one little drop to tell you which way it went. Now, when you get to the point that there are no more little drops, now we're in the grid search pattern. And this here is a little map that kind of shows you. And this is where GPSs can help you because it'll display this, this, your track in three dimensions so you can see and not walk over the same ground twice. Uh, but basically, once you've established that path of uh, travel or what you think is the path of travel, you or you and your buddies, whoever's out there, uh, begin to basically walk over all the ground looking for mostly the deer at this point. I mean, you're still looking for blood, but you're more likely to find the deer once you get into the, the grid search probably than a piece of blood. Now, if you do find a spot of blood, then you can uh, basically re-congregate all your people at that spot and start your grid search from that location. But um, yeah, this is usually you're looking for that white belly which is easy to see, but if the deer's turned around and, and you're looking at the, the top brown, really, they can be really hard to see. And sometimes you have to almost step on them before you can see them. Not for sure. Also look for, look for bird activity. You know, this is one thing, um, if there is a deer down, sometimes the crows will be some of the first to um, pick that up. And so if you see a couple of crows flying around making some sounds, uh, that's a good place to go check too. So we talked about the dogs. Uh, dogs are really good at what they do. Uh, the main tip here is don't mess up the trail yourself. If you and all your buddies are walking around in that grid search all over Kingdom Come, when the dog comes there, just think about all the different smells that it's smelling and it's trying to pick out a deer that might be 12 hours old or something that becomes an exercise in futility. So if you back up, don't mess up the trail and you did get a decent hit, dogs are pretty successful, but of course it's something that you do pay for. Mm -hmm. Now there's a fantastic episode of uh, the hunting public, which is a YouTube show um, I think it was last year, possibly the year before they all kind of blends together, but, um, they use dogs and they, they spent hours looking for deer and looking for a deer. And then they finally called in a dog and the dog did what they did in hours and five minutes. And, uh, it was, it was crazy just to see how, I mean, dogs are amazing. And, um, if you got the ability, I mean, give them a call, see what their prices are. It usually varies on how far away they are from you, honestly. And then the dog might take a couple of minutes to find your deer. But um, if one's near you, it might not be that expensive. If one's far away, it might be, but it's worth giving them a call. And um, this is the part where, uh, Curtis, this is where you can actually find them at. Oh, yeah. Nice. Beautiful. Yeah. You know, yeah, United Blood Trackers. United Blood Trackers. Cool. And, and who doesn't love to see a dog in the woods for any reason? I mean, like that's the purest form of joy. When you get a dog and get them out in the woods or in the marsh or in a field, like, uh, there's no pure form of joy in the whole world. I'm convinced of that. Yeah. And I would definitely be at ease if a dog was on a trail of my deer instead of me just on my hands and knees, as you described. So if I can get one out there to try to help me find it, that'd be great. For sure. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'll go over field dressing. We're getting close to when we said the webinar would be over, but this, uh, this and CW are our last two topics. So um, we do have a video on this. Like I said, it's very good, I think. Um, and again, there's other videos online that you can kind of get an idea. If you have any questions about this, you can let us know. And um, we'll, so we'll just get into it real quick and I'll go over the key steps that you're going to want to make sure to do and uh, the don'ts more than the do's, honestly. Um, so Here's what a, a deer a processing kit may look like. Um, you really only need one knife to field dress a deer. Uh, you can also use a saw whenever you need to cut um, the ribs. So it has a little hook there. So that way you can kind of 
not go into the organs as much, but that might be used to cut up the ribs. Uh, I would probably use um, this blade maybe because it's not as pointy, but the pointier the blade, uh, the more chance you have of nicking uh, an organ that you don't want to nick. So the rounded blades are a little bit nice. These are also probably a skinning blade as well. Um, but, uh, and then that gut hook is there. If you ever see a knife that has a gut hook on it, um, that's going to be used to kind of cut open the skin. So you would have that part of the knife go into the skin and use that almost like a zipper going up the sternum of the animal. Um, but sometimes these blades inside the gut hooks aren't as sharp as they should be, and it might look cool on the knife, but then you go to use it and it doesn't work very well. So you gotta make sure you have a quality gut hook there if you're going to use that, um, or else you go to plan B and just use the regular blade of the knife. Um, I've had that happen a couple of times. I feel like those gut hooks are like impossible to sharpen. Yep. So they're good maybe once or twice, but after that, unless you got some little rounded file that you can get in there to sharpen it, but after that it's kind of worthless no for sure yeah you definitely want to have your knife sharp um even bring out two knives have because i mean depending on the deer that you're working on and what how your knife cuts uh it can be dulled within one processing of a deer easily so having multiple knives could help you out with that so um step one is going to be cutting into the body cavity and this is the the, the chance for you to mess up the most is the beginning process of this. And then after that, you're doing okay. So the number one thing to remember people, people always say that they'd be happy going out, but they're scared of field dressing. Um, don't be too afraid of it. Honestly, as long as you don't cut open that paunch or the stomach area or the intestines, you're going to be fine. So be very slow with what you're doing and just make sure you don't cut too deep and you'll be okay. So you're going to want to kind of use your fingers and the knife and cut into the sternum there and uh, open that up. So there's going to be layers of skin. Um, so there's going to be that first layer of skin. And then there's going to be like this kind of white material that's going to be um, underneath that. And you're going to cut through that as well. Um, so, yeah, so you start down at the hind legs and then um, work your way up and hold the knife so that the blade is sticking up um, towards you and not down. And another tip is to wrap your pointer finger kind of once you get that hole made, you can stick your pointer finger in on the tip of your knife and that's going to help protect it from cutting organs as well. Um, so that will be good to not cut any of those organs because honestly they're being held in there by the muscles that you're cutting through. So as you're cutting it open, the organs are going to be kind of pushing out and that's going to make them easy, even easier to cut. So just to be aware that that's going to happen as well. So the organs are going to be coming out at you as well. Um, tease open the abdomen um, cavity exposing the uh, intestines and then be cautious not to cut them so yeah like I said as you're cutting that open that's going to be popping out and then there he is he's using two fingers um, to help spread that open and hold back the guts from coming out and with the back of his hand and then he's going to be cutting up the rest of the way Then you're gonna get to the sternum, which is where the ribs are. It's really easy to cut through those if you have a, a nice knife. If not, you can use a hatchet or a saw um, to kind of cut up. Uh, if you're not mounting the deer, uh, I would cut all the way up to the end of the neck of the deer. Um, it just makes everything else easier. If you're mounting the deer, you can do this without cutting this part, the upper part of the chest area, the skin there. Um, and just have to reach up in there with your hands and do some of this kind of blindly, but you can do it as long as you're doing it slow and safely. Um, especially when you cut the esophagus up there, that's going to be the dangerous spot. Make sure your other hand isn't in the way and you nick your thumb or your, your hand, uh, up there as you're cutting the esophagus. So you're going to move all the organs out of the way, uh, on the inside there is going to be a diaphragm and that's going to be kind of like a curtain it's going to be a curtain of these organs that are there and you're going to cut those along the ribs to expose the upper organs so the bottom organs are going to be your intestine your stomach the upper organs are going to be the heart and lungs so you're going to cut that open and then also cut up the sternum to open that up as well so here you can see the sternum's cut up all the way the organs are kind of out of the way you can see that diaphragm diaphragm oh my gosh diaphragm flap sitting there um i would cut that all the way to the skit to the to the body and uh he has that kind of cut slit right there but um it really doesn't matter um you can make this thing again you can be as messy with this as you want 
Um, as long as you don't puncture the organs, you're doing fine. So people are always just kind of hesitant to do this, but really you can make this look like Freddy Krueger attack this thing. As long as you didn't um, puncture any organs, you're good to go. And wearing gloves is a great idea. Um, they make gloves now. You can go pick up packs of them that go up to your elbows. Um, they're kind of orange and they, they, they work great. Um, and you pack them out, they're super light. Um, and it really keeps you safe from getting any type of uh, pathogens the deer might be having. You never know. But it also just helps you with cleanup as well. So don't be afraid to wear gloves. There was a long time there where it was a manly thing to not wear gloves. Just wear gloves. It's so much easier to clean up. Um, so then after you get um, detach the organs from, uh, you can cut the esophagus and kind of pull that out. All that's left is kind of the rear end. Um, don't be shy with cutting out the anus. Um, so you're going to want to cut around that. The better job you do of that, the easier it's going to be to pull out because it is held in there pretty well. So you're just going to cut a circle. There's going to be kind of a soft spot around that. So you can hold on and cut around that. So that way um, you can pull the intestines out and then you can pull everything out at that point. It's all connected and you have an empty cavity of a deer. And then you're going to pull the deer up and kind of drain the blood out of it. Uh, organs to keep would be the heart, liver, uh, kidneys, if you like to. Um, and I, I for sure, heart, number one organ to eat. It's delicious with eggs. You can also do all kinds of recipes with heart. Uh, liver, it's super healthy for you. It's definitely a strong flavor, but um, it's almost like taking a vitamin pill. Those things are super, super nutritious for you. Uh, Curtis, anything to add? I think that might be it. All right. And then tra transporting you know, so out the tongue. Oh yeah, the tongue. Yeah, sure. You can get the tongue. Really, really small on a white tail, so you, you got to collect quite a few before you can do a whole uh, tongue taco spread for the friends or family. But the tongue is very good, just small. But the time to take it is uh is when you take the heart, liver. When you cut that esophagus, you can actually go in there and uh, cut the tongue at the base, and then that actually that removing the tongue it makes sure that the blood don't coagulate in the neck. And it just gives it more room for all the blood to run up if you hang them uh, head down. So mm -hmm. um, then transporting out. Oh, and also with the organs, um, bring Ziploc bags. If you have a pack, bring Ziploc bags with you. So that way you can throw this stuff in a Ziploc bag. So plan if you plan on taking any of these organs um, or you think you're, you're going to want to, if you're not sure, just make sure you have the the Ziploc bags in your bag to bring them out with. Um, and the, the liver is huge compared to the heart. So I, I've taken like lobes of the liver before just to try it out to see if I like it or not first. And then, uh, and I do, I actually don't mind it. But uh, even if then you don't like it, good fishing bait. So, oh yeah, worth, that's worth it. keeping. It's better than turkey liver or chicken liver that you buy at the store, stays on the hook better and um, catches more fish. I yep. think. Yeah, we're all about game utilization here. So the more you can use the animal, the better it just is uh, as a hunter. We like to use as much as we can. And then um, don't be afraid to go out and get a cart, um, spend money on a good cart, because I've seen so many carts break while hauling them out of the woods. And uh, it's good one just for your back and for traveling long distances, but also it keeps the deer cleaner than just dragging them straight out. Um, it's going to be fine if you drag it out. It's no big deal, but it does kind of, you might get some leaves and dirt up in the insides there and if you are waiting a long time before processing your deer you're going to want to make sure you clean that out before you take it to the processor yeah even a sled can help a lot yep um, and not not quite as easy as a cart but a sled will make the deer much easier to pull and then also keep it a lot cleaner too yeah and of course tag your animal as soon as you walk up to it uh, we don't have that really on here and then um, hanging your deer. So a lot of people talk about different ways to hang the deer. Just like there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. There's a lot of ways to hang a deer. Um, so for this, there is actually an enzyme in the meat that works and helps cut uh, down, makes the meat more tender. So um, the enzymes will sit there and work at the deer and make it more, not more flavorful, but more tender meat if you let it sit for a while. Um, so um, you can do this as long as it's between 34 and 37 degrees. So again, you don't want it to really freeze, but you don't want it to be over that 40 degree mark so bacteria can grow. So if you can have a place or if the outside is cold enough and you can have it sit there and it's generally between 34 and 37 degrees, you can hang your deer for several days. Uh, so, 
and we have a uh, YouTube video where we talk to Chuck Stites, who's a local beer processor here and also a former professor at the U of I Meat Sciences. And he talks about how long you should hang your deer on this YouTube video. It's our number one watched video, actually, with like over 50,000 views. So thank you for Chuck for sitting there and talking to us about how long to hang a deer for. Um, and then, uh, so again, you can go for five to seven days and uh, the older the deer, the longer you're going to want to hang it because their, their muscles are a little bit bigger and more dense. Um, so uh, young deer, you can go for two to four. And if you hang it um, with uh, the neck up or the head up, it's easier to skin. Um, but again, heat rises. So that heat's going to be going up into that neck cavity. So if you hang it with the legs up, then the heat will escape through that empty out body cavity that way. So whichever way you're, you works best for you, you can hang it up, head up or, or feet up, whatever works. Usually whatever's down is also going to be the dirtiest, uh, just with hair and stuff. So I always do it the other way. I'm most comfortable doing head down and um, I'm fine skinning them that way. And then most of the mess is at the top of the neck rather than the, the rear hands, which is where most of the meat is. But just my choice works both ways. Sure. And then we had a question asking if it was okay to carry a deer out on your back um, after field dressing it. Um, so in Illinois, um, you can, if you're going to carry out the whole deer on your back, if you're on public land, I might want to have some orange on so that way people see you and not the deer. Um, just for safety reasons, you're walking on public land. Um, if you're on private land, then you can do whatever you like. Um, and also in Illinois, as long as you keep the, the sex of the animal, um, proof of sex of the animal, you can um, quarter out animals and field dress them in the field and uh, bring back the whole body that way on a backpack. Um, so just like kind of the Western hunters do. So if you're really in somewhere deep and uh, you want to quarter out the animal and, and pack it out of the woods, you can do that as well. Yeah, just remember to only leave the guts. The only thing that you can leave on public land is the actual, the internal organs, the guts. Mm -hmm. Can't leave anything else. It all needs to be packed out. And if you are traveling to other states, make sure you look in the regs, because I know in like Alaska and a lot of states, um, it's you have to pack out every bit of meat before you pack out the head and antlers. So even if you do things in the wrong order, um, mm. in some states, you can be in violation. So make sure you, you check out those regs before you go anywhere. Now, good tip. All right, Curtis, you want to finish this off with some CWD in the closeout? Sure. Right. Yep. Just a little bit on CWD. So CWD is a hot topic. A lot of you have heard about it. It's a prion disease, which makes it very interesting and very curious and quite frankly, very scary. So this is the same kind of a prion is basically a folded uh, protein and it's responsible for a number of these neurological disorders in different animals. So with cows, we call it mad cow disease. With sheep, we call it scrapies. Uh, in human, there's the Crutchfield Jacobson's disease. Um, and in deer, the, this prion causes CWD. And so CWD is specific to deer, just like scrapies is to sheep and mad cow disease is to cow. The problem is, is that these things can sometimes mutate and can jump species, as was the case about 30 years ago when it comes to mad cow disease. There was a number of people, I think, in Europe and then a couple of people in Texas who, who got mad cow disease. And so all of a sudden, we did have proof that prion diseases can jump the species barrier. Now, that being said, no person has ever, to our knowledge, got CWD from a deer, uh, just like no person has ever got scrapies from a sheep. And we've been eating sheep for thousands of years. So uh, the chances are extremely, extremely low. However, since people have got mad cow disease, it would be incorrect to as, uh, assume that the chance is zero. Now, because of that, uh, basically what you do if you get a CWD infected deer is up to you. So if you're hunting in areas with high prevalency, definitely encourage you to test those deer. You can get them tested from the state. And then when they give you the results, if your deer is positive, they will give you another deer tag. 
uh, probably for next season, because this season's probably over by the time you get your results. But so you will get a free deer tag out of it, but they don't, um, they don't mandate that you get rid of that meat that that is completely up to you. Um, I will say personally, if I get a CWD positive deer, I'm not going to eat that deer. I know the chances are incredibly remote. Um, I, I know that, but I also do not want to be patient zero. <laughs> so uh, my personal choice is not to eat a CWD positive deer, but that is up to each and every individual hunter. And yeah, quite frankly, what I told you about it is kind of what the scientific community knows about CWD. We don't know a ton. We know it's very uncommon for it to jump the blood brain barrier of different species, but they've been studying it. They know that CWD is not just in the brain and the spinal column. It is throughout the meat. They've even injected prions and uh, they've done really bad experiments where they've injected it into uh, primates brains. And sometimes they've got it. Sometimes they haven't got it. Results have been all over the place. So basically, it's something we don't know a lot about. It's a potentially it's a big threat to the white-tailed deer population across the country. And it's enough of a concern with people that I don't eat the deer. Most uh, health departments are going to recommend that you probably not eat the deer, but none of that is mandated. So it is up to you. One of my best articles well written that I've ever uh, read about CWD, Hank Shaw from Hunt, Gather, Cook. And he's authored a bunch of books like Buck, Buck, Moose, Duck, Duck, Goose, and other cute books that rhyme. Um, but anyway, he wrote a really good article about it on his blog, basically spells it all out uh, from the good, the bad, um, basically tells it from all sides. And at the end, he says, you know, given all the information, I probably wouldn't eat CWD positive deer either. Um, so kind of along the same boats as me, but again, that's, that's up to you. Now there are some mandatory, if you do get deer in some certain areas, make sure you know, um, it's mandatory testing in these areas. So when you're in the high preval prevalency areas, every deer that gets shot, they are going to test those. And usually they'll just go in, you kind of see the, in the little picture there, right at the base of the jaw, there's two uh, little glands that basically sit right at the base of the jaw and they can slice in there and uh, they look like little lima beans. Just take out those two little glands and that's usually what they use to, to test for CWD. So you get to keep the rest of the animal and they can even do it on an animal that you intend to mount. Uh, they can do that without messing it up too bad too. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then um, we were asked, what is a CWD hunt? Um, and in these counties, I imagine, um, I'm not sure, I don't know exactly which counties have them, but there are, uh, there's another weekend of hunting for, uh, this is called a CWD season. So it allows hunters to get more, more time out in the woods to try to harvest another animal um, in these areas, because they're really just trying to keep, unfortunately, the, the cure right now that they're going with is to keep the deer populations pretty low in these areas to try to keep them from spreading from each other. So um, it's more of a calling and, um, so we're going to be, they're allowing hunters to go out and, and hunt a little bit more in these areas. So it's, if you're in these areas or want to travel these areas to hunt um, for another season, um, look into those tags and see if you're able to do that. It's kind of, it's a, a different management strategy because now instead of maintaining population, they're actually wanting to bring it down. So the CWD season is usually uh, designed to even go beyond the harvestable surplus and to keep that population maybe a little bit lower density than it is elsewhere in Illinois. Uh, and that's just the lower density of the population, the lower amount of different animals that a, a certain animal encounters, and the lower the disease rate transmission. A complex equation, but mm -hmm. every little bit helps. And so far, Illinois has been uh, um, better than a lot of other states at controlling CWD. I think part of that is just the natural fragmentation of the uh, habitat that's out there. But basically, it's, it's, it's not rocket science to know that any disease that jumps from animal to animal, a lower population density or having uh, basically areas uh, between different populations is going to reduce that spread. 
upcoming webinar. So the last one in this uh, little series here, this one's going to be really fun. We're going to talk just about deer stand placement and the, the methodology of hunting and deer behavior and really get into the weeds and all that stuff and really talk about, okay, hunting season is coming. Where, where are you going to start? Where do you put your stand? Where do you put your trail cameras? How do you find out what deer are out there? We're going to be talking about all this stuff September 22nd. There's a TH at the end of that, but it's 22nd. Don't worry. Nope. <laughs> um, and uh, at 7 p.m. So this one's going to be a later one. Again, we'll record it. So if you can't make it, we'll have a recording for you. But this is going to be a lot of fun. Definitely, if you can make it, this is one where hopefully we get a lot of questions and a lot of interaction and, and we can go ahead and shape that one to you. So we'll try to get whatever questions you have answered. And then, of course, we got to mention Hunt Camp. This is something that uh, it's a brand new thing. We've never done something like this before, but um, we're it's a collaborative event with basically all the major hunting and outdoor groups of Illinois. We're all getting together. And the big, big theme here is giving back to hunters, getting hunters together, getting that social capital that's been lost from the deer check stations and the old hunt camps that don't happen anymore. We're going to try to recreate that in some small way on October 1st. And we hope you all can be there. We're going to have some awesome prizes. And I'm talking mentored hunts that are really cool. Archery, deer hunts, squirrel hunts. Some people are going to be hunting with us, the Learn to Hunt staff. We got uh, duck hunts and squirrel hunts and archery deer hunts on there. Um, a bunch of mentored hunts that you folks can win for free. And then also some sweet gear. Uh, Vortex Optics hooked us up with some binoculars, range finders. We've got other stuff on there. All this is just going to be giveaways for hunters at hunt camp. Um, so we're going to be trying to have a good time. We're going to be hooking up people with mentored hunts and some gear and it's, uh, sharing stories, eating some food. We're going to have burgers, hot dogs, some Kopi burgers, even, uh, grilled up on site. So definitely October 1st, come on out to the quarry for hunt camp, get your tickets today. Uh, they're not sold out yet, but we do mm -hmm. expect it to, to sell out. So get them, get them while they're hot. Yep, it's fifteen dollars for a single and twenty dollars for a pair, and you get dinner. Um, so I don't know where else. I you can't run a McDonald's anymore for that. For two people going McDonald's, and you're paying over fifteen dollars anymore. So, um, sure. come on date out just night. for the food. It's date night. There you go. Yep. It's figured October first. And the quarry is uh, a really know. pretty spot too. Oh, it's a beautiful venue. Yeah, look at the. Uh, just look it up online beautiful sand volleyball courts and uh we'll be playing cornhole and have trivia a bunch of prizes and like jason said what what else can you do around chicago where you get food games maybe win prizes uh for 20 bucks for two people mm -hmm. all righty yeah hey right um now. so follow us on instagram and facebook and check out our youtube channel and also our uh we have a Facebook group for it called Illinois Learn to Hunt Connection. Um, so you can check that out and you can, that, that's more of where our participants go and you guys talk to each other on there. We are kind of hands off on that. We might chuck in some information on here and there, but um, that's really for you guys to take over and try to meet new people with that. Um, and then Instagram and Facebook, great spots for reminders of different lotteries and seasons that are coming up that you might not keep an eye on by yourself. And YouTube is where our podcast you can find at. Also, our podcast is on iTunes and Spotify, um, but also informational videos and webinars are going to be up on there, too, from the past. So definitely check out um, YouTube. It's going to be probably the, the number one source for hunting information um, and educational stuff is our YouTube page for sure. So make sure you join that and subscribe to all of our stuff. We appreciate it. Um, so we'll hang out here. That's it. Um, but if anyone has any more questions, we appreciate the questions we got today. Some of those were really, really good. And um, just let us know if you need anything. And we're always here. You can shoot us an email whenever you need us. And we'll get back to you. So we're here to help you guys out. So let us know if you need anything. And if not, we'll see you next time. Sorry for going a little late. It's just it's yeah. you know, it's like it's exciting stuff. You know, where do you stop? <laughs> I know. I'm excited for this season to start here. Yeah, it's coming right down the pipe. Hopefully we see a bunch of you October 1st at Hunt Camp, and we'll be really excited by that point because it'll be here. <laughs>